All right. Good morning. I want us to begin chapter 13, which is the Civil War in the United States. So the content here gets into the political changes, the economic importance of the war and significance in how each side's going to try to pay for the war. And then also the, um, the military strategy itself. So let's get started. All right, notice the dates here in uh, chapter 13, we've got 1861 to 1865. So this is the actual civil war. It's gonna take four years to fight. And I want us to first look at the, um, the declaration of secession. So South Carolina starts this. We, we talked about this before at the end of chapter 12, where you had the um, election of 1860 and Lincoln's election was going to, to cause an uproar in the South and South Carolina starts this with their order of secession. So this is from the actual document, the South Carolina or Ordinance of Secession. And look at the, the content here where we've got the Confederate leadership beginning their discussion with the actual end of the American Revolution. And so they talk about that the Revolutionary War ends with the Treaty of Paris 1783. And notice the wording here that um, the British acknowledge that the United States and they list all of those different states are free and independent states. But then look at the part that I've got highlighted here. Thus were established the two great principles asserted by the colonies, namely the right of the state to govern itself and the right of the people to abolish a government when it becomes destructive of the ends for which it was instituted. And concurrent with the establishment of these principles was the fact that each colony became and was recognized by the mother country, a free and sovereign independent state. So in the minds of South Carolina, in the, in the, the order of secession here, they're stating that when the nation was first created, it was created as 13 separate states. And then they're tying this back to once again, John Locke's social contract. So this is looking at the idea that the United States is a compact of states agreeing to work together unless there is cause for the contract to be broken. And so here they're saying that it is perfectly legal to secede because in the minds of South, in the um, government of South Carolina, they believe that their state has been unfairly treated, okay? So then they go on to tie this back to slavery. So when you've got people who are arguing that the, the Civil War was about states' rights, yes, that's what they're saying in that first part, but you've also got to continue and read the rest of it. So the same article of the Constitution stipulates also for, the, for rendition by the several states of fugitives from justice from other states. So they're going back to the Fugitive Slave Clause that was in the Constitution. So they've kind of fast-forwarded from the, the victory in the American Revolution to the actual writing of the Constitution, which was again, a compact of states. And then they're saying here, for many years, these laws were executed, but an increasing hostility on the part of non-slaveholding states to the institution of slavery has led to a disregard of their obligations and the laws of the general government have ceased to affect the objects of the Constitution. So they're making this about slavery. So it's North versus South over the issue of slavery. So as the war began, um, if we look at the preparedness to fight in the war, this graph I think does a, a good job of explaining how greatly everything was stacked in favor of the union. So if we're looking at resources, so if this is comparing total population here, the blue part of the bar is representing the Union, and then the yellow part is representing the Confederate States. So in total population, obviously the Union has the advantage here, and that's important because you're drawing your military from your population. So there's more people to draw from to create a military. Male population, 18 to 60 years old, again, incredibly in favor of the Union. Free men, 
um, 18 to 16 years old from military service in 1864. So we've got, again, this idea of, um, you know, more people being ready to fight in an earlier period. So this is telling us that not everyone was, was joining in by 1864. All right, wealth produced. So you've got more money to pay for the war. Railroad mileage, why would this be important? Merchant ship tonnage, why would that be important? Naval ship, factory production, textile goods, iron, coal, firearms production. Why would all of that be so very important for the Union? Well, they're able to supply their military cause. They're able to move materials with the, the um, railroad and the transport. If we're looking at farm acreage, yes, there's still more farm acreage um, because we're talking about producing crops. So that favors the North. Um, draft animals, we're, we're talking about horses to fight in the war. That's gonna be one of the big consequences that often is overlooked is after the war's over, not only were there hundreds of thousands of um, soldiers who were killed, but there were also a, an incredible shortage of horses um, after, the Amer after the Civil War. And then wheat production, corn production. So really the only area where the Confederate States have an advantage here is cotton production. And the South is banking on this cotton production that's not only feeding the Northern textile factories, but also the European textile factories. They're counting on this to hopefully gain an alliance with either Great Britain or France. So with all of this stacked up against the South, why in the world does this war last for four years? Well, again, you're going to see that there are going to be some military mistakes made by the Union. There's going to be the fact that the South is fighting a defensive war. They don't have to win any territory. They don't have to go and claim any territory in the North. They're simply trying to outlast the North. So they're also fighting for a cause that they um, are very committed to. And so for, for those reasons, the Union mistakes and then also the fact that it is a, a war, a defensive war for the South, it's going to end up lasting longer than really anyone would have, uh, would have thought. So it all started, we talked about at Fort Sumter with the firing on this fortification out in Charleston Harbor. You can go and visit there. Um, if you go to Charleston today, you take a little ferry boat over. Um, it's about a 20 minute ferry boat ride from the, um, there's a museum here at the, at the harbor in Charleston and then you go out to the fortification itself. So when you go, they it's a part of the National Park Service. They have an excellent, excellent group of rangers that will tell you the story of Fort Sumter. And then you can just climb all over the fort and you can look around through the, uh, the different parts here and you can see where it all began. So this is from the top of the fort looking back. You can again see this would have been where cannon would have been placed. And again, you can just climb all over the fort. Every day they raise and lower the flag. So if you go in the first ferry boat um, time, right, you're allotted a certain amount of time, the ferry boat goes over and then you're, you're on the fort for a period of time. And then everyone has to leave and the ferry boat goes back. But if you go on the first one of the day, Number one, it's gonna be a lot cooler if you're going in the summer, but also you'll see this, um, this ceremony where they raise the American flag every day and they ask for any veterans in the audience to present the flag and it's, um, it's quite moving. Um, inside on the fort, they also have another museum there and they've got a replica model of what was going on. And then you can see here why it's strategically located. Charleston we know was a very important city even going back to the colonial period because of the, the trade, the rice trade that was going on here. So the fort is right here in the middle of the harbor. So it's kind of like this lookout protecting uh, the coastline of South Carolina and its important city of Charleston. So I was there in the summer and I've also been there in the dead of winter. So this was in February and it was incredibly cold. Um, but again, you can kind of get a sense of the distance. Here is the Ravenel Bridge in Charleston that goes over to Mount Pleasant. And then also here is um, the, the coast, um, the Charleston coast as well. And so there's the little ferry boat that you ride over. This is actually one of my professors from Georgia State. She and I worked together on a number of projects and we were there scouting things out for taking a group of teachers there later 
um, that following this was in February, we were taking a group of teachers out there in July. So it was quite different when we were there the second time around. All right, so again, the Confederates were really banking on the fact that they were going to gain an alliance. So this is kind of hearkening back to the American Revolution where the colonists were hoping to gain an alliance with the European power as well, and a war that they felt would be very difficult to win otherwise. So the Confederates believe that their production of cotton is strong enough and important enough to the British that they would come in on their side. So if we look at this um, graph here, this is showing cotton imports in pounds. You've got the darker line is, is showing the British import. So this is the amount of cotton that Great Britain is importing to use in its textile, textile factories. And then the lighter line is showing how much of that cotton is coming from the United States, in particular the South. So by the time we get to, um, here's the 1820s. So again, this is with the invention of the cotton gen would mark this massive growth of this. Um, but then by the time we get to the 1850s, look at how much of this is coming from the American South. Almost all of the British cotton is coming from the American South. And so they know that financially Great Britain is dependent on this group of states that have now seceded from the Union. What they weren't banking on was the fact that Great Britain, okay, so by the time we get to 1860, this is down a little bit, but after the war, it changes dramatically because the British have found other options for buying cotton. They've started to, to purchase Egyptian cotton and Indian cotton. So that's going to, to cause them not to wanna to get involved in this war. Um, for a couple of reasons, they can find other economic means for supplying their textile mills, but then also as the war becomes more and more entrenched with um, um, conflict over slavery and emancipation, that's gonna cause the British to not wanna get involved as readily. All right, so the first of the big battles here will be the Battle of Manassas or Bull Run. So a lot of these battles have two different names, okay? The Battle of Manassas is the name of the town um, that's nearby. And then you've got Bull Run, which is the name of the body of water that's nearby. So um, depending on which side you're on, the battles are either going to be named for the city that's nearby or the geographic feature that's nearby. So this first battle of Manassas or Bull Run, so this is July of 1861. Remember the election was in November of 1860. Then you've got in December, South Carolina seceding. And then in January, February, March, you've got the other deep South states that are seceding. And then Lincoln takes his first inaugural address uh, or takes his first oath of office when he becomes president in the spring of 1860. And then that launches the others into secession. Um, and then with the um, fighting at Fort Sumter. So by July of 1861, you've got the declaration of war. You've got Lincoln who has asked for volunteers. You've got the, the command in place and the fighting will, will occur. So look at it in proximity to Washington, DC. Bull Run Manassas is going to be about 30 miles away. Um, the Confederate capital is Richmond. So they're fairly close in proximity to one another. Um, and the, the fighting here is at uh, Bull Run, again, on this body of water near the little community of Manassas. You've got the two commanders to start with. Irvin McDowell is going to be the Union commander to start with. And then the Confederate Army in this part is going to be led by uh, General Beauregard. You've got Robert E. Lee, who's still here protecting the um, Confederate capital at Richmond. Beauregard's going to be in charge here at the First Battle of Manassas. So everyone thinks, again, this is gonna be quick and easy. This may end up being the end of the war. The um, Confederates believe that if they can win and they can march on Washington, then that's going to end the war. And the Union believes that if they can just, you know, crush the Confederacy right here at Bull Run, that's gonna end it as well. A lot of folks in Washington, D.C. also thought that this was go going to be quick and easy. And they actually took picnics out to go and watch the battle. So again, that kind of gives us an indication of how lightly they were taking this particular fight. Um, but if you notice the outcome here, you've got um, thousands of soldiers here 
um, who are going to be fighting. And um, you can see that there are quite a few casualties that I don't think these people who had come to watch this battle were really counting on. They literally brought picnics and they were sitting out over a, you know, an open area watching over this battlefield. And then it gets larger and more out of control than they had anticipated. So they, you know, have to frantically gather up their belongings and get on their wagons and try to get out and not get caught up in the chaos. When it was over with, the Confederacy had won. Okay, so if we go back over here and we look at these losses, um, you've got um, more killed and wounded and captured, right? Uh, the Union Army than the Confederate Army. And so <clears throat> the Union Army retreats back to Washington, D.C., and this was seen as a victory for the South. So once again, think about the momentum. You've got the momentum of, of capturing Fort Sumter. You've got the victory at the Battle of Manassas and uh, Beauregard's in charge here, but one of the, the key commanders who is helping to protect um, Manassas and, and to force the Union Army back was Stonewall Jackson. And so those are the two main leaders that are at Manassas and then Lee is still protecting Richmond at that point. So here, here's who is involved. You've got Erwin McDowell, the Union commander, and this does not bode well for him, right? So Lincoln is pretty frustrated that he has let this get out of control. Um, General Beauregard for the Confederate military and then also Stonewall Jackson. So these are the, the two uh, men who win at Manassas. Lincoln is pretty frustrated. Um, by all of this, and he's going to have trouble finding a commander who's going to, to really finish the job off, um, as we'll see in a few minutes. So when this all starts, okay, the Battle of Manassas is really the first true battle of the war, um, and it begins here on this guy's farm, Wilmer McLean. He's just this, um, he has a, a pretty large farm here outside of Washington, D.C., and the Confederates take control of his home, and use it as their headquarters. And then the battle's gonna be fought out on his, on his property. Um, so after it's over with, McLean and his family, you know, they're just horrified that this has all happened and they're, you know, they're worried and they feel like Washington DC is going to kind of be a focus for the war. And so they abandon their home and they move to this little remote area um, in Appomattox, which is about a hundred miles away from Manassas. And there they, you know, they, they move. Four years later, when all of this is over with, coincidentally, the surrender of Robert E. Lee takes place at Wilmer McLean's house in Appomattox. So the war literally starts and ends in Wilmer McLean's house. Two different places, but it's um, the same guy. So it's, it's not that he was offering this up. It just, it was just it happened that way, which is, I think, another one of the unusual parts of this war. So Lincoln, of course, was pretty frustrated with McDowell, replaces him with General McClellan. So this is his first change there. So there's General McClellan, who becomes the new commander. Now, McClellan is very, very careful, very, very cautious, um, and is, is a planner, right? So he really, he's methodically planning his next approach in the war, where he's going to move and how he's going to handle all of this. Um, and McDowell is now fired. McClellan com comes in um, and it's not going to go well because McClellan is way too cautious. He's never ready to fight. He's like, oh, I've got to have more, more resources. I've got to have more soldiers. I can't attack here. And he never will finish the job. And it drives Lincoln crazy. So when all of this began, Lincoln had actually offered command of the Union Army to Robert E. Lee because going into the war, Robert E. Lee was by far the best commander in the U.S. Army. He had you know, graduated from West Point. He was one of the, the top soldiers in his class. He had experience from the Mexican-American War, as many of them did. But everybody knew that Robert E. Lee was the best military mind out there and the best military leader and commander. So Lincoln had offered him command of the Union Army, and Robert E. Lee, who was from Virginia, chose to side with his state. So for the rest of the war, Lincoln is constantly trying to find someone to match up with Lee's skill. Now, that's going to also be another factor 
as to why the, the Confederacy is able to hang on as long as they do is because they have such strong leadership and Robert E. Lee. So McClellan is very slow to react, never thinks that he's fully equipped to be able to go into battle and it, it drives Lincoln crazy. Lincoln's gonna go through all of these commanders <laughs> throughout his war. Now, Winfield Scott, he's, one, he's very old. He was one of the, the main leaders in the uh, Mexican-American War. So it was not really expected that he was gonna be a field commander and all of this. He does lay out the, the overall strategy as we'll see in just a minute. Um, but it starts with McDowell, then McClellan, then we go into General Pope, and then we come back to McClellan, then he fires him a second time, then we get into Burnside, and then Hooker, and then Meade once we get to Gettysburg, and it will not be until after Gettysburg, at the end of 1863, that Ulysses S. Grant is promoted to overall commander. So during all of this time, Grant is going to be kind of focused out in the West, Western Tennessee. Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama, that area is where Ulysses S. Grant is going to be, be fighting. And he actually catches the attention of, of uh, Lincoln and Edwin Stanton, who's the Secretary of War. And that's eventually when he gets promoted because his style of fighting is what Lincoln's been looking for this entire time and was never able to find it. So it was just one transition after the other, trying to find a general who would finish the job. So there's two main objectives that Lincoln is going to try to secure to win this war. Number one, he wants to capture the Confederate capital of Richmond. And then number two, he's got to secure the border states. And we're gonna talk about those border states uh, quite a bit. There were four slave holding states, states where slavery was allowed that never joined the union. Okay, so those four border states are very strategic because as things go along, you know, and they drag out longer and we're kind of stuck here in a stalemate and nobody's really, you know, about to win, those border states are important because if they switch sides and join in with the Confederacy, that could be trouble uh, for the Union. And um, so this is something that Lincoln desperately wants to maintain. So throughout all of this, he's trying to take Richmond and he's trying to make sure that those border states stay with the Union. All right, so here we are, 1862. So one of the next important parts of, um, or what will be the, the doom of McClellan. Um, so he wasn't fired immediately after Manassas, but this is what does him in here in, in 1862. So about a year later, he's going to try to capture Rich Richmond because again, remember that's one of Lincoln's objectives. So he leaves Washington and he's going to follow what's called the Peninsular Campaign. So this peninsula that goes um, into the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia uh, leads into Richmond and McClellan is moving up the peninsula and he hesitates, okay? And he doesn't feel like he has enough supplies and he's not ready to fully capture Richmond. So this movement across the peninsula into uh, approaching Richmond takes too long. And as a result, the South is able to, to reinforce itself and it ends up being a failure. So it's not um, actually a loss for the South and it's not actually a loss for the Union. Um, it, it just, it, it doesn't end up materializing in the way that Lincoln and his commanders would want they need to seize and take control of Richmond and end this war as quickly as possible. And because he took too long, they're able to, to reinforce Richmond and he has to retreat. So this is um, seen as a failure. And that's when Lincoln says, you're gone, you're out of here. So he fires him. Um, the border states, these are the four that we're talking about, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland and Delaware. And I would absolutely make sure that I know these four states. So these are slave holding states that never joined the Union. So these 11 states in gray are the Confederate states, but the yellow ones are different and they're very strategic, All right, Look at why. Delaware's protecting Philadelphia um, in Pennsylvania, right? So that port there is, is very important. Maryland, 
is if you lose Maryland, then Washington, D.C. is totally surrounded. Virginia and Maryland would have been surrounding Washington, D.C. And then you've got all of this farm producing land here in Missouri and Kentucky that is helping to supply the food for the Union soldiers. And you've got the important rivers that go through here that are the supply lines that are essential. So look at this quote from Lincoln. I hope to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. He has to keep these border states uh, in, in order to preserve the Union. All right, one of the controversial actions uh, of Lincoln is his suspension of habeas corpus. And this is a provision within the United States Constitution that requires people who have been arrested to be brought before a court in a timely manner and told what they're charged with. You can't just arrest someone and not have a reason for it and hold them indefinitely. So habeas corpus is a right that is guaranteed in the Constitution. But during the course of the war, Lincoln suspends it, meaning that temporarily for right now, habeas corpus doesn't apply. So if you are arrested or captured as a prisoner, think about what's going on here, prisoners of war, then by Lincoln suspending this part of the Constitution, then people can be held as prisoners without having a trial. This was not going to be practical if you had to maintain habeas corpus during the time of war. So when he does this, there are critics, even within his own party, who believe that he may have overstepped the bounds of the Constitution. Does the president have the authority to take this action? Lincoln believes that he does, and Lincoln believes that it's necessary. So we have to, to look at, um, at why uh, this is, is being done. Um, you also have to remember in the South, Jefferson Davis does the same thing. They have habeas corpus written into, the South wrote their own constitution, the Confederate constitution, and Jefferson Davis suspends that as well. All right, so notice what it says here. The constitution provides that it can be suspended only when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. Well, Lincoln's saying we are certainly in rebellion and this certainly qualifies for this power. The people who believe that he have gone, has gone too far are going to be known as the Copperheads. So these are people within Lincoln's own party, within the North, um, and, and some Northern Democrats as well, who believe that they've gone too far. So look at this cartoon where you have Copperheads who are challenging this power that the Union has taken. So again, here's Lady Liberty, right? She's got the shield for the Union. And she's taken this action. Um, and then the, uh, the Copperheads are going to say, we need to go ahead and as quickly as possible, create peace in the United States. So as we look here, the Peninsular Campaign, like we said, is going to, to take place. We've also got more fighting that's going to occur here deeper into Virginia um, over the course of this early period of the war. Also notice all of these ships that are over here along the coast. That was another part of Lincoln's strategy that was developed by his first commander, Winfield Scott, when they're planning all this out. And that was a Union blockade. They did not want the South to be getting supplies from Europe. So this blockade along this Southern coastline all the way around, all the way through the Gulf to secure New Orleans as well is critical for the South, okay? Here's where Grant begins to make a name for himself. So there's Grant um, and he is in Western Tennessee over here at Shiloh and Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. And he is going to really be an aggressive commander where if you look at what's gone on with McClellan um, um, and McDowell, you're not really seeing that. And so this is all problematic, but people are beginning to notice what Sherman is doing in the West. Very, very aggressive action. So the Battle of Shiloh in April of 1862 really isn't a victory for, um, um, it, the, at first, Grant's caught off, off guard. So the Confederates are actually initially going to have a little bit of success in early April of 1862, but then Sherman 
I mean, uh, Grant regroups and they're going to get control of things in the West. And then this is when they begin to set their sights on the Mississippi River. So once they've got control of the Tennessee River um, and the in this area in Western Tennessee, then they're going to begin to move down the Mississippi River and try to get control. So this was part of Winfield Scott's plan. And we're gonna call it the Anaconda plan. And Anaconda we know is a snake that suffocates its prey. And so it's two parts. They want a naval blockade around the Confederate coastline to make sure that they don't get any supplies coming in from Europe. And they wanna split the Confederacy along the Mississippi River because this is the main route that's going to be providing resources to the interior. Um, and so we've got the, look at this imagery. So the snake is, is suffocating the South. That's kind of the plan here that Winfield Scott is, is is taking, and this is going to be the overall approach that the Union Army is going to try to follow. Um, one of the most important battles here in 1862 is the Battle of Antietam, and I would certainly emphasize this in your notes because McClellan here um, is, um, is in charge, and Antietam is going to be fought in Maryland. And we've already said that Maryland is a border state. So again, this is a critical, critical battle. Um, Lee believes that if he can win it at Antietam and get control of Maryland, then the Union will have to, to surrender and give up. McClellan wants to, again, protect this border state. So you've got this standoff and it is in September of 1862. And it is this single bloodiest day um, in military, in U.S. military history, okay, September the 17th, 1862, you've got tens of thousands of people who are going to be killed in this one battle, in this one community. Um, so this Battle of Antietam is, is known for a couple of things, all right, so this is um, an incredibly destructive battle. The Union wins, but they allow Lee to retreat. So once again, Lincoln has a problem because McClellan um, does not finish the job. Okay, so McClellan is going to win. Lee has to surrender the battle, but he's allowed to retreat. So instead of forcing the surrender here, Lee's allowed to retreat. Part of that McClellan is just overcome by the losses. There are some very famous images that are part of the battle at Antietam. This one that you see at the top, this one is used quite a lot when you're looking at the Civil War imagery. And we associate this photographer, Matthew Brady, with the um, Civil War images, because again, we've got photography that's now um, available. And so the images of the war are going to be important in their influence on people in the North, okay? So if you look at this, uh, these images from the battle, these were not actually taken by Matthew Brady. They were taken by one of his associates named Alexander Gardner, who um, takes images of these, um, the battlefield dead, and then all up and down Antietam Creek and, and all in the area. And this collection of images will be in Matthew Brady's studio in New York, where people can go. It's almost like a museum where people could go and view them. And I want you to read what is in the newspaper here in the New York Times about this exhibit in Matthew Brady's um, gallery. Okay, so look what it has to say. The living that throng Broadway care little perhaps for the dead at Antietam. So now think about where's Broadway? Broadway is one of those main thoroughfares in New York City. So the people living in New York City, they care little for the dead at Antietam but we fancy they would jostle less carelessly down the great thoroughfare, saunter less at their ease, were a few dripping bodies fresh from the field laid along the pavement. So what's the point there of that statement? So this um, article is trying to say that because the, the war is not in their community, many of the people in the North are not really impacted by it. They don't understand the significant losses. They don't understand the horrors of the war because they're not experiencing it firsthand in their own community. So then look what it says. As it is, the dead of the battlefield come up to us very rarely, even in dreams. We see the list in the morning paper at breakfast, but dismiss its recollection with coffee. 
right? So we read the names, but if our loved one's not there, we kind of dismiss it and go on about our day. There's nothing very terrible to us, however, in the list, though our sensations might be different if the newspaper carrier left the names on the battlefield and the bodies at our doors instead. So if you were to reverse it and you had the carnage that has come out of Antietam in New York City, there might be a different response by people in the North. Then look what they say about the exhibit. Mr. Brady has done something to bring home to us the terrible reality and earnestness of war. If he has not brought bodies and laid them in our door yards and along our streets, he has done something very like it. Okay, so this is talking about the importance of imagery, the photographs and the impact that they will have on people in the North to continue this fight, okay? <clears throat> this is another image. This is a, another Gardner image from uh, Antietam. So remember, Antietam's in Maryland, not terribly far, far outside of Washington, D.C. And when Lincoln got the reports on the dramatic numbers uh, of, of casualties that had come out of that, uh, that battle, Lincoln demanded to go to the battlefield and pay his respects himself. And of course, his, um, his, his leaders within the government said, terrible idea, you know, the president shouldn't be going to a battlefield, it's too dangerous, he could be captured, he could, you know, get caught, something could go wrong. Lincoln insisted, and he goes to Antietam, and, and when you look at this, you can just see on his face the uh, the impact that it was having. And then these are two of the, the commanders there and then some of his security detail as well. Um, I don't know, there's just something about this image that I think is just very profound when you look at, at Lincoln's face there uh, inspecting the battlefield, okay? Here he is having a little chat with McClellan. I can imagine that that's not a very pleasant conversation that he's having there because the, the Lee wasn't, pursued and wasn't forced to surrender. Because again, the Union won the battle, but they didn't finish the war. Okay. Also, uh, we are beginning by this point in 1862 to begin to see more and more African Americans trying to join in with the Union Army, trying to escape slavery. And this man, Benjamin Butler, uh, is going to be one of the first who kind of creates this loophole and he calls the slaves contraband of war, uh, meaning that they are, um, if, the, if the union seizes the, the property of war, then that's allowed, okay? So if slaves were considered property of the South, then Benjamin Butler is going to call the slaves themselves contraband, which would allow them to be confiscated by the North and not have to return them, right, with the Fugitive Slave Act and all of that, because it's going to be contraband, okay? So it's this definition, it's this turning of the definition of contraband. Um, so um, the legislature eventually is going to pass what's called the Confiscation Act, which is going to play on those same lines that um, slaves would be considered contraband and would be in, included in what is being seized by the Union Army, which would get them out of slavery. So um, people began just showing up in droves, trying to escape slavery, and they were beginning to follow along with the Union Army. Okay, Lincoln, after that battle at Antietam, is also going to issue what's known as the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay, so this is going to be on September the 22nd. Remember, the battle was on September the 17th. So this is within a few days of the, the end of that battle. Lincoln issues this Emancipation Proclamation. And this is very, very important. Look what it says. Whereas on the 22nd day of September, um, 1862, a proclamation was issued by the President of the United States containing, among other things, the following. Okay, here's a direct quote from the Emancipation Proclamation. On the first day of January of 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state 
the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States. Okay, so any, any slaves held in a state that is still in rebellion against the United States on January the 1st, 1863, shall be then forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. All right, so think about what this is doing. So this was issued in September of 1862. And the wording of it says that any slaves held in the state still in rebellion on January 1st of 1863 will be free. Okay, couple of things to consider here. So is anyone freed on September the 22nd, 1862? No, but a couple of months down the line, if states are still in rebellion, then the slaves would be free. What would have happened if Jefferson Davis and the Confederate government said, okay, we surrender, war's over. Would anybody have been freed according to the provisions of the Emancipation Proclamation? No. So what might have been the purpose of this document among other things? There could be a couple of purposes here, right? One purpose is clearly shifting this war to be clearly about ending slavery. You know, he'd been saying all along, um, if I could end this war without freeing a slave, I would. If I could end this war with freeing every slave, I would. That this would be about keeping the union together. But now this is clearly making it about slavery. Okay, what about the border states? Remember those four states? Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. Aren't those slave states? Are they in rebellion? No, because those states are still part of the union. So does this apply to their slaves in those border states? And the answer is no, okay? So this really doesn't free anyone at the time, okay? Freed those slaves located in the rebelling states. Look what it does. So these states in red, are not part of the Emancipation Proclamation. These states, do they view themselves as part of the, uh, the United States anymore? They view themselves as another nation. So can another nation, can the United States pass a law that impacts a different nation? And their minds, no. So what this is doing is it's making ending slavery part of the war effort. This becomes clearly a focus. And so at that point, the British and the French, they're out. They're not gonna get involved in this at all because now this is clearly going to be internationally seen as one of the main aims of the war. One of the other parts of this is that it also will allow African-American soldiers to enlist in the United States Army, in the Union Army. So the Emancipation Proclamation, this is at the end of the Battle of Antietam. Now. He had actually drafted this in the early summer. So like June, July, August, that area, um, I'm sorry, June or July is when this had actually been drafted. And his, um, his cabinet had encouraged Lincoln to wait for a victory because if that was issued after a series of losses, then it would make the union look desperate. So he held on to it until the victory at Antietam and at that point is when he issues the Emancipation Proclamation. But again, think about what it's doing. Think about the timing. It's issued in September of 62 to go into effect in January of 63. So it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's partially the purpose is, is making one of the war aims about abolition, but part of the purpose could also have been about getting the South to surrender. Um, in an effort to, um, to keep their slaves, potentially. All right, so let's move on to when things escalate even further, okay? So Lincoln, again, is still quite frustrated that none of his commanders have been able to finish the job. And we're going to see in 1863, a transition in the war, okay? We've also got to pay for a war that's lasting a lot longer than anybody would have thought. 
So um, the federal government is going to raise money in three different ways. And look at the proportions here. They're going to have direct revenue through taxation. Um, and that could be a tariff, a tax on imported products or actual um, excise tax on luxury items. That's gonna be 20% of what they're going to be bringing money in. Big businesses, they're going to tax them as well. So that brings in 20% of the money needed to fight the war. They're also going to sell bonds. And this is where they make the bulk of their money to finance this war is through selling bonds to wealthy investors and also to international investors. So that's gonna pay for 65% of the war. Then to make up the rest of it, they're going to issue paper money, okay? So we're gonna call this the Legal Tender Act. Tender is like cash. So this is um, the, the money. So notice this Confederate money, you've got George, I mean, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln on here. And we've got Washington DC, we've got Lady Liberty over here, and this is a, a $10 bill, okay? Um, and this would be 15% of the financing of the war. So the bulk of it's going to be brought in either through taxation or through people buying bonds, which was we've said before is an investment where you get a piece of paper. And then at some later point, you get the value back plus interest. All right. The Confederates are also desperate for money. So look how they do this. They're going to have 10% um, brought in by taxation, okay? Um, but it's going to be at the state level. So these states are going to be providing um, taxation money. Then also they're going to have the one-tenth tax which is where any commodities that are grown on farms within Southern states has to be turned over. Those crops have to be turned over. So that's what they're going to be using to feed their soldiers. They're going to borrow um, 30%. So initially this is going to be coming from foreign bankers. And then some of the, the upper class, the planter class, the, the wealthy, wealthy Southerners are going to contribute a good bit of money to start with. But as the war drags out longer, that donation uh, is going to dry up because many of those people become disillusioned with the war. But notice that the paper money that they print is going to pay for 60% of the war. So it's almost the reverse of what's going on in the North. They're just printing more and more and more paper money. How much value does paper money have? Not a ton. All right. Now let's look closely at this Confederate um, bill. So states of the Confederate States of America um, will pay $5 to the bearer. Okay, but look what it says. Six months after the ratification of a treaty of peace between the Confederate States and the United States. So this is saying that six months after it's over, whoever's holding this paper dollar, paper $5 bill, can redeem it. Okay. Um, after it's over with. What happens if the South loses? Is there a treaty of ratification of peace between the Confederate States and the United States if they lose? Because the Confederacy won't exist anymore. So if they lose, all this paper currency has no value. So this is going to be, think down the road because we know how this plays out and the South loses. If 60% of this is being transacted, all of the business in the South is being transact transacted by this paper money, when they lose, you've got an economic crisis in the South, significant economic crisis um, when this is all over with. Okay, also both sides are going to have a draft and another word for the draft is conscription. So I would make sure I'm familiar with both of those terms. The draft means that the government requires you to serve in the military. So conscription and draft are the same thing. Um, so here we have three years of service. This is for the South. Um, we'll have conscription. The North is also going to have a draft as well. But in the South, three years of service for all males between 18 and 35. And then when they started having just massive losses, they upped the number uh, to 45 years old. And then there were exemptions. So people who were not required to report between that age range 
um, could be exempt for every 20 Negroes that you owned. So if the 20 Negro rule, as it was called. So if you had 20 slaves that you owned, that would give you one exemption. So if you owned 100 slaves, then you could exempt five people, which might be um, the owner of the plantation, a couple of sons, and maybe an overseer. So for, for every 20, then you had an exemption. You didn't have to report. So that means that, uh, and then you could also hire a substitute. So if you had $300 cash, now not this paper money that's floating around, but $300 in gold currency, then you could hire a substitute who would take your place in the draft. So this might be someone who had already served. It could be someone who might actually be a little younger. Okay, so we had 16, 17 year olds who sometimes would hire themselves out as sub substitutes. Confederate Army is not going to care. Um, so what this is telling me is that with this, this um, policy, this is a war that's being fought by the poor because there are exemptions for the wealthy. You had to be wealthy to own 20, 20 slaves or more. Remember that um, proportion that we looked at? You had $300 cash and gold, that is thousands and thousands of dollars in today's money. So to hire a substitute, you had to be very wealthy in order to be exempt from the draft. So this becomes a poor man's war, okay? There was also a draft in the North and there were riots um, that took place in the North, the draft riots in New York City. Over, over some of this because again, there were exemptions and it became more of a, an immigrant class, lower class that began to be drafted into the war. Okay, there were also um, regiments that were put in the, the Union Army made up of African-Americans. So the United States colored troops were very important in the war. One of the more famous of the regiments is this, the 54th Regiment, um, uh, Massachusetts. The 54th Massachusetts Regiment would be the best example of the United States Colored Troops. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Glory, it's got Denzel Washington uh, in there. The movie Glory is based on the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. And so they are uh, going to be paid to, to serve, not equal to the pay for a white soldier, but they will be paid and they will serve very, very bravely throughout the war. The 54th Massachusetts, they end up in a terrible, terrible fight in South Carolina and many of them are killed in the process. So the United States colored troops, very important in, in the cause. There's also going to be a code of conduct that is important for the war that comes out, the Lieber Code is actually from Germany, but it will be, um, a German is, is going to be writing this, but it's adopted by many countries around the world. And it's about um, treatment of prisoners. It's about humane treatment of, of the wounded during a war. And so these humanitarian efforts are couched in what's called the Lieber Code, which is still important in modern military history as well but this is the first time that we see it implemented. All right, so notice that, that part of this is about um, no torture being allowed, no poison, um, fair treatment has to be um, provided. And it's, uh, again, it's going to be adopted by a number of other countries in the late 1800s, and then also will play a factor into some of the, the early 1900 uh, conflicts getting into World War I uh, in the, the fair treatment of prisoners during war. That didn't always play out as we'll see in some of the, the prisons here uh, in the Civil War, but there was this attempt, the Lieber Code was kind of um, couching this war effort um, in, in rules of conduct. So Civil War medicine also was greatly lacking um, there was significant problems with dysentery, um, infection. You know, if you were fortunate enough to have survived a battle, but you were wounded, there was a high probability that you would die from gangrene or some other infection from your wound. Um, in these field hospitals where you had maybe an arm or a leg that had been severely injured, there was not time 
to, to try to have some intricate surgery that really probably wasn't even mastered at that point to save your arm or your leg. So the, the best um, option was amputation. But there were so many that had to be dealt with that there wasn't time to properly clean and sterilize instruments between patients. So you might have, you know, one person who their leg was amputated and then the next person comes right in on their heels and the same instruments are being used for am amputation and there's been no cleaning of it. So you can imagine the level of infection that, that takes place. Um, one effort to try to, to clean up the disease that was rampant in, um, in uh, military camps was the US Sanitary Commission. So they're going to, to kind of lay out some rules about digging latrines and, and where you've got soldiers um, being kept and, and trying to maintain at least some, some semblance of um, you know, medical support to try to, to alleviate some of these problems. Clara Barton is going to be the founder of the American Red Cross and she was a nurse in the Civil War and she provided care to both sides. And that goes back to, the, to that labor code where you've got injuries um, and you're dead, the war dead, they had to be treated humanely. And then also um, um, medical assistance being provided for um, the injured. And then you also had one of the, the first female doctors that practiced during the Civil War. And there she is, Elizabeth Blackwell, who was part of that. So this would have been a, an ambulance service that would have been used during the Civil War. Again, very, very um, um, primitive type of, of medical care that's going to be provided. So these prisons that we're going to find, there were Northern prisons and there were Southern prisons as well. And one of the more famous of the prisons is here in Georgia, which is going to be the Andersonville Jail. And these are where prisoners of war were kept. And as supplies began to, to really uh, run out in the South, the last thing that they were worried about was feeding and clothing properly prisoners uh, in their, in their um, prison camps. So the Andersonville prison is in Georgia. It's down kind of west of Macon. Here is a depiction of it. So you've got these fortification walls that go around. Uh, they're being monitored and you have all of these prisoners that are, are housed inside the Andersonville jail. So notice how overcrowded it was. There were 45,000 soldiers who were there and over 13,000 of them will die of starvation. Um, so this was uh, a horrific scene here in Georgia at the Andersonville jail. And when it's all over with, um, there's only one Confederate leader who is executed for war crimes. And that is the commander, Henry Wirtz of the Andersonville jail. So Robert E. Lee is not executed for war crimes. Stonewall Jackson, I mean, Stonewall Jackson dies during the war, but Robert E. Lee, the other uh, command, Jefferson Davis, none of them are executed for war crimes, but this man was because of the horrific conditions that, um, that were um, engaged in at the Andersonville jail. Okay, so July 1st through the 4th, 1863 is a time period that is critical to turning the tide of the war towards an end. Okay, so we've been fighting now since uh, 1861, all the way through 1862 and halfway through 1863. It's just been this back and forth. It's just been carnage. It's just been one battle after the other, but very little momentum one side or the other. That changes with these two battles that are fought simultaneously, July 1st through the 4th, 1863. Okay, Gettysburg is here in Pennsylvania. So I would make note of that, that it's in Pennsylvania. So is Pennsylvania a Confederate state or a Union state or a border state? It is a Union state. So this is a, a non-slaveholding Union state. Gettysburg is right across the border. Uh, into Pennsylvania. So it's not, you know, terribly far north into Pennsylvania, but it, it is in a Union state. And then Vicksburg is right here on the Mississippi River in Mississippi. So these two battles are going to change the tide of the war 
um, to swing it in favor of the North. Okay, so let's look at these two battles. At Vicksburg, this is again where Ulysses S. Grant is going to make a name for himself. He's already started to draw the attention of uh, Lincoln and some of the others with the battle at Shiloh um, in, um, in, in Tennessee, in Western Tennessee. But then as he begins to set his sights on Vicksburg, remember part of the Anaconda plan initially from Winfield Scott was to secure the Mississippi River and split the Confederacy in half. That's the objective that Grant will fulfill. And it's gonna take six weeks of incredibly heavy fighting for him to do so. So all through June, here he is trying to secure Vicksburg, right? So Vicksburg is right on the river. Um, he's going to take heavy fighting. They have tried to, the Confederates have tried to fortify Vicksburg. And then eventually he does secure the Mississippi River. Okay, so Vicksburg falls to Grant. So keep that in mind. Grant and Sherman are here at Vicksburg and they win. So they now have control of the Mississippi River because he goes farther to the south, secures the whole uh, region for the Union. At the same time that that was finally completed, so that the turnover of Vicksburg is going to be like Jan I mean, uh, July 2nd, July 3rd, somewhere in there. Okay, so when that has been six weeks in the making, they turn over Vicksburg, the Mississippi River is lost to the Confederacy. At the same time, you have a three-day battle in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And this is one of the key battles in the entire war. Again, it turns the tide. We talked about turning points before. A turning point simply means it's a point where a change is made. So whereas we've got kind of this standoff, nobody's winning, nobody's losing, this is a turning point because now it turns everything in favor of the Union. So Lincoln has again kind of gone through a few commanders. He's now um, focused on George Meade is the Union commander, overall commander here. Um, and Robert E. Lee is still in charge of the Confederacy. And there has been rumbling um, by this point that people in the North are frustrated. They're not interested in continuing to fight the war. It's too expensive, too deadly. And Lee wants to capitalize on that. And he believes if he can take the war to the Union, think about what they were talking about in that um, newspaper article with Matthew Brady's exhibit, that people in the North didn't necessarily feel the effects day to day of the fighting. If Lee can take the war into the Union, then that may cause people in the North to withdraw their support um, and, and withdraw, okay? So here we've got uh, Robert E. Lee moving into the North to fight in Pennsylvania. And he is met by George Meade in this little community of Gettysburg, okay? And it's just kind of a little crossroads. There was nothing there. Um, and this was where the battle just, it just happened, okay? And it's gonna take three days. So when it's all over with, look how many are killed. 23,000 for the Union, 28,000 for the Confederacy. So this is certainly more then was lost at Antietam, but it was over three days where Antietam was in one day. Um, when it was over with, Lee had made a, a tactical error at the end as we'll see and cost many, many lives. When it was over with, he, he submitted his resignation to Jefferson Davis. He's like, you know, I, sur you know, I give up, I'm not your commander. And Jefferson Davis refuses to accept it and tells him, you know, keep going. Um, it's not over with. So Jefferson Davis is not willing to acknowledge that defeat is near. Lee is starting to see that um, things aren't, aren't going to be going well. All right. So when this was, was over with, um, the battle at Vicksburg is also going to be over. So both of these are going to be strategic victories for the North because they're going to turn the South back. They're not going to be able to encroach further into the North. It's going to end up collapsing on itself. Okay, so here is the progression of events. So notice, let me move myself over here so you can see these maps. So this is the first day of the battle, July the 1st, 1863. Here's the little town of Gettysburg. And Gettysburg kind of sits down in a valley and there's high ground all the way around it. Um, and you can see that in red is going to be the um, Confederate forces Blue is going to be the Union forces. And notice that we can see that it is kind of in this valley. Look at all the names of the places around it. Seminary Ridge, 
Culp's Hill, Benner's Hill, Wolf's Hill, Powers Hill, Little Round Top, Round Top, those are mountains, Cemetery Ridge, Barlow's Knoll, Oak Hill, McPherson's Ridge, Hare Ridge, right? So you've got all of this high ground around it. And we know that in a military operation, whoever controls the high ground has the advantage, okay? So look at what's going on here in day one. So in day one, you've got the Confederates that have controlled this high ground. At the end of day two, look what happens. So Lee and his forces have pushed through. The Union has retreated back beyond the town and then they've kind of gone up the other side. So it's almost like we started here and we went in this direction. So they've kind of moved to the high ground on the other side. When I was in college at Georgia, um, one of the classes that I took, it was a, a course on the Civil War. So it was one entire course over four years of history. So we, you know, it was battle after battle after battle. And our professor, he had this huge sandbox in the classroom. It was the coolest thing. It was on wheels and it was this big, big, um, huge square sandbox. And he would roll it in and he would recreate the battles. He had army men that he had painted blue and gray, right? Blue being the Union soldiers and gray being the Confederate soldiers um, uniforms. And the... Um, and then he had a spray bottle with um, blue water so he could make like the little streams or the rivers or whatever that were important geographically. And then he would build up, you know, the high ground and, and he would recreate the battle. So when he did Gettysburg, he kind of dug out the center and then had all of this high ground around it. So you could definitely see, you know, this, um, this movement on the high ground. So once the Union gets control of Cemetery Ridge and Little Round Top, this is going to give them the advantage. And so Lee has decided that he's going to do a flanking maneuver, which is where you go around the edges of your enemy, okay? So he wants to curl around here um, with Longstreet, okay, to go around the edge, and then with General Ewell to go around on the other edge, whoops, to collapse the Union in on itself, okay? That's gonna be the plan. This was some of the heaviest fighting of the entire battle. Um, here at Little Round Top, it got to the point where they were in hand-to-hand -hand combat with bayonets. Um, it was just terrible, terrible fighting. And he couldn't get the flank, okay? So overnight, so this was where things ended at the end of day two. So on day one, remember this is where we were at the end of day one. Here we are at the end of day two, desperately trying to complete that flanking maneuver. So Robert E. Lee, who is back here kind of overseeing what's going on, he recognizes that this is some of the heaviest fighting here in, in the battle is on the flanks. So what he believes is that the center line of the Union line is, is weak and that they would be vulnerable right here in the middle. So Lee regroups overnight and decides that he is going to charge through the middle of the Union force and split it, which would then collapse each side on itself. What he didn't recognize was that overnight there were additional forces that were coming in to supplement Meade's line in the middle, okay? Because this would be a terrible idea to go uphill against your enemy but he believed that this was the weak point, okay? So on day three, uh, General George Pickett is going to try to move through Cemetery Ridge and go right through the center of the Union force, okay? This is called Pickett's Charge, where he goes straight uphill um, at the Union, but again, the Union had been reinforced uh, the night before, and it was a complete disaster, okay? Pickett's Charge was, um, um, the men were just decimated as they're moving uphill against an enemy, okay? And again, they were not a, a, able to get around the flank. So in the end, um, Gettysburg was a victory for the Union. But once again, General Meade doesn't finish it off. He doesn't continue to pursue. When Pickett's charge fails, instead of moving towards the, the Confederate line and trapping them and forcing them to surrender, Lee is allowed to escape. So once again, Lincoln is frustrated. You've got the victory in, in Mississippi, but you and you have a victory at Gettysburg, but what you don't have is an end to the war. 
because Lee was allowed to escape yet again. All right, so here is downtown Gettysburg. It is a cute little town. And I was able to go there in 18, I mean, uh, 1863, in 2013, because it was the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. And I was taking a class with, um, um, through Dickinson College, and it was, um, there were people from across the country who were in this class. And my research was chosen to be presented at Gettysburg at the celebration of the 150th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So this was on our trip and they paid for my husband and I to go. We spent a week there. It was just incredible. Um, but because it was such a big deal, that 150th anniversary, there were just thousands of people who had descended on this little town and they had a big um, 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 ceremony and everything at the cemetery that we'll see in a minute. So this is the Gettysburg Hotel where we stayed. And so our room was right there on the corner. It was perfect. And then the train depot is right down. So right down this street down here is where the train depot is. And you can kind of see, um, you can't really get an, an idea of the elevation, but this is right as you're coming into Gettysburg. And this is at the top of the hill and you go down the hill and then here's the little town. So again, it, it kind of sits down in a bowl. So here's our um, picture from our window and you can kind of see that this is going uphill and then this would go uphill. So like we're talking about all the way around, you've got high ground. And I had always envisioned from what our professor had done at Georgia that it was like mountains that were all the way around Gettysburg and it's not. It's like these really long rolling gradual hills but still pretty steep. So that night before the, the ceremony, they kind of reenacted Abraham Lincoln showing up in Gettysburg because the Gettysburg Address is um, in November where the battle had been in July and you know all of these tens of thousands of people had been killed. They created a, a battlefield cemetery in Gettysburg and Lincoln had gone in November of 1863 to commemorate or to, to consecrate the, um, the, the cemetery. So the Gettysburg Address was the speech that he gave when he was there um, basically marking the um, establishment of this, this cemetery. So they recreated all of this in, in 2013. And so here you can kind of see it, but this guy right there is dressed up as Abraham Lincoln. He arrived on the train at the train station and then all these people just flooded into the town and they followed him. So I took this from our hotel room window and you can see that the cars are just kind of getting trapped here as this guy shows up. And then this is TV cameras are, are all um, commemorating this as well. So this is um, where I'm talking about. It's large open hills. So again, if you control this high ground here, there's no way that your enemy can sneak up on you, right? Because you've got this long open area. And this point right here marks where Pickett's Charge took place and we're on the top. Of, of the hill and then down below, right? It's really steep. And so there was really no way that Lee's men were going to be successful there. So it's, it's a, a beautiful place to go and visit and they've got um, a car tour, right? You can listen to it on your car radio and they take you through all the different battlefield areas um, or you can um, hire a um, interpreter to go with you as well. And then they've got a really good museum. So here is the cemetery, Soldier, Soldiers National Cemetery at Gettysburg. And notice the entry here. So they've got July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. And then they've got these Union states that are listed, but they don't list the Confederate states. So now there are Confederate soldiers who are buried there, but they're not part of the, the, the section, excuse me, of the cemetery that is being commemorated by Lincoln. All right, so here's, um, here's what we're talking about. It reminds me a lot of the Marietta Square, you know, where the um, National Cemetery is in Marietta, um, the military cemetery. It's very similar, but much, much larger than the one that's in Marietta. Um, and so at the top of this hill is where Lincoln spoke and gave the Gettysburg Address. So there's Lincoln. And then the day that we were there, November the 18th, 2013, that was commemorating the um, Gettysburg Address, 
there, every Lincoln impersonator in the world, I think, was there that day. And it was, we were very fortunate. We were able to sit here uh, on the front row. This is Antonin Scalia, Supreme Court Justice. He's now dead, but at the time he was, he was there speaking and they had an, um, a naturalization ceremony where immigrants become citizens of the United States. That was part of the ceremony, which I thought was very, very striking and very moving um, to have that there. And um, so then that night, well, here you can see the TV cameras. It was live on um, television. They had this ceremony and my husband, he's really tall. So we were sitting here on this, um, on this front row and he got a text from some of his coworkers because they were seeing it and they could see his head sticking up. Obviously you couldn't see mine, but they could see his. So anyway, um, again, here it was at the battlefield. And then later that night was when I presented my research here at the Lincoln Institute um, in Gettysburg. So it was very exciting that particular night. All right, so let's look at the Gettysburg Address. We're gonna look at the text of this because it's very short, but very, very powerful. So here is an image of Lincoln actually giving the Gettysburg Address. There he is among all of these crowds of people. And it's, it's a dedication of the cemetery, right? So the, the battle had happened months before. He arrives in November to dedicate the cemetery to the memory of all of these soldiers who have died. So look what he has to say. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So four score and seven years ago would be the Declaration of Independence, okay? So they're talking about 1776, a new nation was created, conceived in liberty, and the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, meaning here in 1863, we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come here to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live, right? So this war is about keeping this nation together. So we're here to dedicate this field as their final resting place. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, whoops, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. What's he saying in that paragraph? He's saying what makes this space sacred? is what they did here, what these soldiers did here. They're the ones who made it a special place. They're the ones who made it a holy place, um, consecrated this. What we're doing here isn't making it special. What they did here made it special, okay? The world will little note nor long remember what we say here. Well, actually we do because here we are looking at it um, in modern times, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. All right, think about what Lincoln is saying. Wasn't one of Lee's um, beliefs for going into Pennsylvania, going into a union state, wasn't he believing that people in the North were kind of wavering on their commitment to the war? Look what Lincoln's doing. It is for us, the living, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work. So if we're not actually consecrating and making holy this cemetery, what we need to do is dedicate ourselves to the unfinished work which they fought for, okay? So he's trying to challenge them to stay the course. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. All right, so I would write down this phrase, a new birth of freedom. 
what does Lincoln probably mean there? So he's challenging them to stay the course, to be devoted to the cause, and that we protect this nation under God and that it shall have a new birth of freedom. What's he talking about there? So if we go back to the beginning where he says, all men are created equal, were they really created equal in 1776? So he's saying, let's redefine what freedom is. Redefine freedom. Make freedom now include everybody. So he's talking about slavery. So he's again committing people in the union to the cause, but also making it clear that when this war is over, we've got to adjust our definition of what freedom would mean. All right. So if we look at, um, I know you've done this in English, when you're looking at uh, rhetoric, you've got ethos, pathos, and logos. That whole thing that we read, that is the entire Gettysburg Address. It is very short, but it is packed with all of these components of rhetoric. E ethos, talking about can you trust the credibility of, of what's being said? The emotion, right? You're playing on this emotional response. And then is it rational? Is it logical to, to request something of someone? Have you laid this out uh, in a logical manner? Okay, for logos, let's look at it. So do we have ethos? Do we have pathos? Do we have logos? Yes, we do. Because look, the ethos here, we've got the president, Abraham Lincoln. So you've got trust in what's being said. Certainly you've got the, um, the situation being playing about the, the soldiers who've died there. That's playing on the emotion of, of what's being said. And then the, the task of repairing the country and the new birth of freedom. So he's laid this out in a very logical manner. So this is one of the brilliant um, speeches that Lincoln is going to, to give during his lifetime. All right, so now we're going to finally end the, end the war, because like I said, Gettysburg and Vicksburg would be the turning point. So things are, are not going to um, be possible for the Confederates to win after this, now that Mississippi has been lost, uh, the river's been lost, and then also the fact that they're not going to be able to, to move into the North and cause that surrender. Okay, so Grant is promoted. So after the Battle at Vicksburg and Meade not finishing things off at Gettysburg, Lincoln is going to say, that is the guy, that guy out there in the West, he's the one who I want leading this military. So in, uh, in 1864, in February of 1864, Lincoln is going to promote Ulysses S. Grant to be the overall commander of the U.S. Army, okay? So for about a year, he's going to be in charge. And then by April of 1864, <coughs> you're going to, to see that Lincoln pretty much just puts all of his trust into Grant. So if you read through this letter, he's saying, you know, I trust you. I know that um, the next components of the war are going to be difficult. You know best how to, how to handle this, okay? Grant is going to totally change how the war is going to be fought. He's going to use what's known as total war or hard war, which means that every means possible. If it means um, crippling the civilian infrastructure, if it means um, you know, weakening the economy so that the army can't fight anymore, that's what he's going to do. And so he believes that this has got to wear down the Confederate civilians will to fight. That's gonna be his objective is to take it to them to you know, destroy their resources so that they can't fight anymore and there's no more will to fight. So that's gonna be his philosophy. Totally different from the philosophies of those previous generals that Lincoln has been so frustrated with, okay? So in Virginia, he's going to have this campaign throughout 1864 and 1865, moving through all of these areas starting here, um, through Cold Harbor, Petersburg, Five Forks, um, you know, uh, the Wilderness Campaign, all of this is going to be leading up ultimately to the surrender at Appomattox, okay? Now, all of this time throughout 1864, Grant's sidekick, Sherman, is going to be focusing on the Deep South. 
And Sherman is going to go from Tennessee, okay, from Nashville and Murfreesboro, through Chattanooga into Georgia, down through Marietta, and then eventually capture Atlanta, okay? And so again, think about what's happening. If you've got Grant in Virginia, and you've got most of the Confederate forces fighting in Virginia, but yet Sherman is coming through these Southern states, coming through Georgia, coming through these rural areas where the men are all fighting in Virginia. If I'm a soldier in Virginia and I'm worried about my wife and my farm and my kids back in Georgia being in danger, am I gonna stay in Virginia or am I probably going to desert and come home? So he's trying to wear down their will to fight here. So eventually, um, after some heavy fighting, the um, Confederates are going to win here at Kennesaw Mountain, but Sherman regroups, goes around uh, Marietta, and then eventually will take control of Atlanta in the summer of 1864. And then from there, after he's there for a number of months, he regroups and then moves on to the battle of, I mean, um, the march through Georgia to capture Savannah. All right, so here is the battle at uh, Kennesaw Mountain and the battle for Atlanta. So this is a Confederate victory, but it doesn't stop Sherman. So again, you know, you've got that high ground there. There were cannon positioned at the top. Um, this is kind of the open field, kind of where the visitor center is. If you've ever been to the uh, Kennesaw battlefield, this is where it's all located. And so Joe Johnston for the Confederacy was able to, to hold him off uh, and they win here at, at Kennesaw Mountain. So there'd been a lot of heavy fighting coming up through Cartersville and um, Chatsworth and that whole area, but then they stop the, the momentum, at least temporarily Sherman's momentum here. But then he circles around and then ends up going to Atlanta. But along the way, he stops in Roswell. So the Roswell women, this is a, a story that not everybody is familiar with, but there was, if you've ever been down to the, um, to the old Roswell Mill, there's uh, the waterfall that's down there and there are the hiking trails and everything. Uh, and then there's a covered bridge that goes across the river. Um, that was a textile mill that what they produced was Confederate gray. So that Confederate gray is what was being used for Confederate uniforms. And Sherman, after they leave Kennesaw, they're gonna kind of regroup before they head into Atlanta. And on this side of the Chattahoochee River on the Roswell side is where he sets up occupation. So all throughout this area. And um, the occupation of Roswell, they're gonna take control. If you've ever been down Mimosa Boulevard where the, there's a bunch of churches there, the Presbyterian Church was actually used as a Union Field Hospital for a period of time. And the, the mill in Roswell was one of the targets. And so Sherman um, takes control of Roswell and destroys the mill. And the women who work there, because remember the men are off fighting in the war. So these women were all the mill operators. So here are the Roswell women who are posing in front of the mill. This was before Sherman attacks. But when Sherman gets control of Roswell, he actually captures the Roswell women who were operating the mill and forces them to march from Roswell to the Marietta Square, um, where the train depot is in, in downtown Marietta, puts them on a train and sends them north and they're never heard from again. So that's one of the big mysteries of the war is what happened to the, to, or in, in this area at least, what happened to the Roswell women? There've been a number of books that have been written about this. Um, one, one theory is that they actually ended up in Ohio um, when the, the train left, but they weren't heard from again. So the Roswell Mill, the ruins of it are still down there. You can climb all over the, um, the factory and the mill that was destroyed by Sherman's forces when he was here. So this would have happened in 1864. And um, in 2014, the city of Roswell reenacted the, the occupation. And there was this um, huge reenactment that took place and it was really, it was, you know, I went down, I wanted to, to see what it was. So on the Roswell Square, right down there in, in downtown Roswell, um, I think there's a Moxie Burger across the street and all of that. So there were people dressed up in period costumes. Here are some of the women. And so they're pretending that they are in the town and that they have 
um, they were mill workers. And then you had the Union soldiers who were camped out on Barrington Hall's grounds. Um, and they had a, a whole encampment up there. And then they recreated the takeover. So they shut down the road and the, um, the soldier, the reenactors on horseback, they show up on the Roswell Square and you can see their little kids up in the um, trees watching what's happening. So you've got just these people in period costumes that are kind of blending in with the crowd and they start shouting all these terrible things to the, to the reenactors on horseback. And I was just, it was, it was very dramatic in the way that they did this. And I felt bad because some of these little kids in the crowd, I don't think their parents knew how vivid they were going to be making um, this situation. So there are kids that start crying and all of this stuff because when the ladies were shouting, you know, go back home and leave us alone. And then this guy who's on horseback with his gun and everything, and he was, you know, yelling back at him. And then he orders the women to be taken and so as they're taking these women, right, they, they're jerking them around and they, they take them out of the crowds and look, there's this woman and she's trying to fight back. And these little kids are crying and they get them all together and they march them down into the street and then they, they head out of town. And so these kids thought it was real that these women were being taken and, um, and kidnapped. So it was a very realistic reenactment of what had happened here close by Lassiter um, in downtown Roswell when the mill was taken over by Sherman. All right, in the context of what's also going on here is the election of 1864. So Lincoln was elected in 1860, 1864 is another election year. And Lincoln is having um, a little bit of opposition, remember? So this is, um, you know, he, he's got a little bit of opposition there with what has happened with habeas corpus and how expensive it is and um, that, you know, you've got all of this that's, that's extending longer than anyone ever would have ever thought. But look who his opposition is. The, the Democrats are going to put up George McClellan. That's the guy who had lost the Peninsula campaign and didn't pursue Lincoln, I mean, uh, Lee, and had been fired twice by Abraham Lincoln for his lack of, of finishing the war. And what, what the Democrats are doing is they choose McClellan because he's saying that it's time to negotiate a settlement, an end to the war, a negotiated treaty that would end the war. When Lincoln is saying, you know, in the Gettysburg Address, we've got to finish what has been started and win at, um, and preserve the Union. So this is the, the, the two different um, choices here. You've got Lincoln and you've got McClellan in the Democratic ticket. And um, the, the Republicans are going to actually begin to refer to themselves for this election only as the National Union ticket. And Lincoln actually chooses a Democrat to be his vice president. Now think about why he might do that. He's trying to send a message of reconciliation that this is, you know, he knows that after Gettysburg and Vicksburg, that it's only a matter of time before the war is over. It's about to end. They know this. And he wants to send a message about bringing the union back together. So he chooses Andrew Johnson, who is from Tennessee, to be his vice presidential nominee. And he was from Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee, but he had remained loyal to the Union. He had stayed in the Senate. He had not um, been part of that secession. And he believed that the South did not have a constitutional right to secede. Not necessarily that he agreed with all of the, the policies of Lincoln, but he didn't believe that secession was possible. So he is going to be the vice president under Lincoln, and they call themselves the National Union ticket, right? So there's a Democrat and a Republican working together in the National Union ticket. So again, it's kind of sending this message of healing um, that the war is going to end very soon. So when the election results come out, um, you know, it, it's again, the election is going to be in November, but Lincoln is, again, he's needing some more indication that the South is going to give up their will to fight. And that's where Sherman comes in. So Atlanta is going to be taken by Sherman in September. So he's occupied after um, in July with the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain. That was a loss. He regroups throughout the summer. 
Uh, and then he goes and fights and um, Atlanta is surrendered in September of, of 1864. So he is going to destroy the railroad and destroy Atlanta because this was really the industrial hub of the deep south. And by doing that, he's again crippling the infrastructure where the Confederates are not able to continue. He, um, before he takes over, there's a, a series of letters that go back and forth between Sherman and the mayor of Atlanta, where Sherman actually warns the mayor and says, you know, now's your chance. Civilians, you need to get out. And the mayor says, no, we're not leaving. And Sherman says, you know, I'm warning you, it's time to get out. Uh, and so eventually the civilians do take heed and they leave the city. And then that's when Sherman burns it to the ground. So, um, and anything of military value, which would include the railroads and any of the other industrial centers are going to be laid waste to here in Atlanta. So they're gonna stay here for about a month, um, occupying Atlanta and burning everything around it, okay? November is when the um, uh, election is going to, to take place the end of November. And you can see the outcome here that Lincoln will win the electoral vote pretty convincingly over McClellan. All right, so here's downtown Atlanta. You can see these are railroad tracks that they are digging up and destroying so that they can't be repaired. Uh, and then you've got the smoke of what's going on. Here is Sherman overseeing what's happening in Atlanta. This is from his headquarters, which would be kind of in East Atlanta, near where the Atlanta Zoo is today. Uh, and the Carter Center would have been that area where uh, Sherman occupied and was overseeing everything. And then there was a lot of waiting around, you know, waiting around to see what was going to happen next. So in, uh, in September. So this is downtown Atlanta. Again, you can see the buildings just absolutely destroyed and decimated um, in downtown. This is what's left of the railroad depot. So again, all just completely bombarded and burned. This is Peachtree Street, right near where the Fox Theater is today. So I want you to think about and keep these images in mind once we start getting into reconstruction, the labor and the cost of repairing all of this. Think about what we said the, the South was doing, that they had printed all this paper money. And how's that going to, to um, to handle the economy when the war is over, to repair all of this damage that's being done. Okay, this is uh, what he would do to the railroad tracks. And these are going to be known as Sherman's bow ties. And what they would do is that they would set these huge bonfires and then use cattle and, and horses and everything to drag the rails from the, um, the railroad lines across the top of the bonfire. And you know that when the iron would heat up, uh, really, really hot, then it's more pliable. And then they would put a, a horse on each end of this and then they would crisscross and it would bend them so that they could never be straightened back out and reused. Okay, so this is what we're talking about with Sherman's bow ties. Um, so even all around Kennesaw Mountain and around this area, these were found around trees. You know, if they didn't have them over these big bonfires, they would heat them up and then they would wrap them around the trees and leave them behind. So after he leaves Atlanta, um, Sherman actually goes to Savannah, as we know, and then he curls up into South Carolina and really does the same thing in South Carolina that he does to Atlanta. And in some cases, actually, uh, the damage is, is a little bit worse. When they get to the capital of South Carolina at Columbia, where the orders of secession had originally been written, where all of this started, you can see what's left there uh, in, in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Again, it's just completely laid waste to, okay? The Battle of Atlanta is in the Cyclorama, which is a, a round painting, uh, panels of these paintings. And in the late 1800s, these cycloramas um, would depict different battles and they would travel around and they would put up these exhibits and people would come and see them. And the one that depicts the Battle of Atlanta, so you've got these paintings that go floor to ceiling, and there are a couple of stories tall, and then the base of it would come out, and then it would almost be like a diorama where they would set up these, um, you know, army men and then have all of the buildings and everything set up like a model. 
uh, and you would see it. Now, the the old the original um, cyclorama used to be at the Atlanta Zoo near the Atlanta Zoo, and it was just in terrible um, shape. And the building leaked, and they just didn't have any money, and it was just in bad, 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 bad shape. And the Atlantis History Center purchased um, the the cyclorama, and the well, the city of Atlanta purchased it, and then the Atlanta History Center that's down in Buckhead is had built a new building and it actually opened this past year before the pandemic started. And they have re um, preserved the, the cyclorama and it's there now. And so you can see the escalator, you know, you come in on the ground floor and you go up on this escalator and then you've got this viewing area to see it. And when we hosted these teachers here in Atlanta with these um, professors from Georgia State, we got a behind the scenes tour while they were working on the preservation of the painting itself because again it had a lot of water damage and had not really been taken care of since the the late 1800s so here you can see where they've got different sections of it and the buildings under construction and you can see these artists and so they're trying to match paint colors and they're they're going in and they're touching up different parts so it was fascinating to see these artists that were being brought in to preserve this work of art. So it was um, it was neat to be able to get to see that behind the scenes part. And then the pandemic hit, so I haven't been able to see the finished product yet. All right, so Sherman's March to the scene. So notice that he will occupy Atlanta from July to September, uh, early September. When is that election? The election's at the end of November. So from September to um, December, he is going to march through Georgia. And this is where he's going to live off the land. He kind of goes off the grid and his supply lines are, are not going to, to follow him and, and um, slow him down. He's going to live off of the land. So as he cuts through this rural area, he's going to occupy farms. He's going to take all of the, um, the cattle and the chickens and the meat and the corn, anything that's being grown there and he's going to live off of it. Um, so notice this quote from Sherman, I intend to make Georgia howl. So if he's going to be doing this with a lot of destruction along the way, right, he's burnt down Atlanta, and now he heads into these rural areas where the Confederate soldiers were from primarily, then you're going to, to really break their will because mostly this is going to be old people and women who are still here. Um, and, and that's going to, to break their will to fight. So that's his march to the sea. That's going to be his purpose there. Um, when he gets to Savannah in December, he writes this letter to Abraham Lincoln, December the 22nd, 1864. And look what it says. So it says at the end of his famous march, um, he sends this letter to, or a telegram to Abraham Lincoln saying, I beg to present to you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah with 150 heavy guns, plenty of ammunition and 25,000 bales of cotton, which we know that on the world market that that can bring money for um, the federal government. So once this has been secured and this capture of Atlanta in September, this has helped Lincoln secure um, the election because it looks like they're going to win, right? You don't, you're, you're wearing down the South they're not going to be as committed to the cause. You've got the victory at Gettysburg and, and Vicksburg, and now you're taking it to the civilians. So Sherman's victory in Atlanta is pivotal in securing the election for Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so at this point, it is all lost. After Sherman curls back up through um, South Carolina, and you've got uh, Grant securing Virginia, all of those victories along the way, then finally, the surrender happens um, in, uh, at McLean's house. There it is in Appomattox, Virginia. So I would make sure that I am familiar with that. Appomattox, Virginia. And this happens on April the 10th, 1864. I mean, uh, 18, 1865. April the 10th, 1865 is when the surrender occurs at Appomattox. So when the surrender happens, Lee signs it. And then Grant allows Lee and the other Confederate generals to leave, okay? So that was one of the conditions because think about what's happening here. You may not have everybody on board in the South with the surrender. So if they take 
and they execute Robert E. Lee, who's this hero in the Confederacy. If they execute him, will the people in the South stand down? Will the war actually be over? Probably not. So this was a, a very delicate situation um, uh, that occurred. And so there is uh, Robert E. Lee leaving um, after the surrender has been signed at Appomattox uh, in Virginia. All right, so there we have it. There is the end of chapter 12, um, I mean uh, 13. So we've got the end of the Civil War. And in chapter 14 is where we get into reconstruction, the very, very difficult process of rebuilding and figuring out what to do. Now that the war is over, how is this all going to work? How are we going to come together politically, socially, and economically? So until then, keep reading and go make history.